fate plays a very important role. And I could have been born some other country. I was born of, of parents that gave me an exceptional upbringing, exceptional opportunities for an education. And then look at the other things that happened to me. I had no control over these things. So whatever you want to call it, you know, whether it's fate or whatever it is, there's something that made it possible for you to have this kind of a life. A good life may be blessed with serendipity, but a meaningful life is one that makes the most of it. Blue skies smiling at me Ain't nothing but blue skies Do I see Michael E. DeBakey's tireless work ethic pioneered the field of medicine. As a mentor, he infused a standard of excellence upon generations of pupils. And as a hometown hero, he changed the world, making all those from the state of Louisiana proud. Sweet home, New Orleans. DeBakey was born in Lake Charles, Louisiana, back in the fall of 1908. He received his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from Tulane University and completed his internship and residence in surgery at Charity Hospital, all in the city of New Orleans. After prestigious surgical fellowships in Strasbourg, France, in Heidelberg, Germany, with renowned professors René Lariche and Martin Kirschner, DeBakey returned to New Orleans as a faculty member of the Tulane School of Medicine, Department of Surgery. During World War II, he volunteered to be a member of the Surgical Consultants Division in the Office of the Surgeon General of the Army. During this time, he helped develop mobile army surgical hospitals known as MASH units, and also helped establish the Veterans Administration Medical Center Research System. In 1948, DeBakey became the chairman of the Department of Surgery at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Under his guidance, the neophyte field of cardiovascular surgery began in earnest here in the United States. Cardiovascular surgery really developed after World War II. There wasn't any cardiovascular surgery uh, of any significance when I was a medical student. There wasn't much you could do. Uh, it's all up to God. <laughs> DeBakey soon changed all of that, crafting many of today's most popular vascular procedures. Well, I think one of the major developments in that regard, particularly from, let's say, vascular standpoint, there's something cardiac, was the development of the surgical treatment for aneurysms of the aorta, particularly thoracic aorta. And we, we did the first successful operation for an aneurysm of thoracic aorta here, and a replacement with a graft. Uh, and we developed the surgical treatment for aneurysms, not only of the descending, that's where we started with the descending thoracic aorta, but we went on all the way up to the ascending aorta and the arch, and for our dissecting aneurysm there. Uh, then, of course, these, the major developments that took place in cardiac surgery primarily occurred after the development of the heart-lung machine by John Gibbon and his first successful use of the heart-lung machine in 1953. DeBakey also pioneered work with the carotid endarterectomy, transplantation, and the artificial heart. Well, I, I, I participated in some of the early pioneering developments, but I was one of, of many others who were, you know, participating in developing pioneering developments at the time. I had the good fortune to do some of the maybe the first successful clinical cases of, of certain types, like a carotid endarterectomy, and, but the endarterectomy had been done by Dos Santos, so I just used his technique. I mean, and, and, and the idea of resecting a, 
a vessel and replacing it uh, with a substitute led to my development of the Dacron graph. Uh, but there were a number of other people who were, were participating in that at that time too. So pioneering work goes on. Uh, it's not, not done solely by one individual. Uh, many of my colleagues were working at the same time in, in developing it. Over 60,000 patients, more than 1,600 articles, 50 honorary degrees from prestigious colleges, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the National Medal of Science, inducted into the Academy of Athens. Do you get the idea this guy has made a difference? Awards too numerous to mention, advancements too plentiful to recount. So which one of these does he consider his greatest achievement? I must uh, really admit that probably it's, uh, it's the people I train, because that lives on. Uh, you, you, whatever technical or scientific knowledge you may have uh, provided often is surpassed by new knowledge. but. Real values in medicine uh, live only by being handed down to others. The values DeBakey instilled in his trainees were of uncompromised excellence and were often communicated with a little tough love. There is uh, an aspect of me that maybe can be described as intolerant. I I'm intolerant of stupidity. Uh, and and I, I, I would describe stupidity as the inability to learn from experience. I had my residence with me. Um, I, I, I sometimes would be a little harsh in my criticism. Um, I never, I never dealt with them in a in a way to humiliate them, uh, and I, I tried to express my intolerance by, in a sense, being intolerant myself. Myself, uh, if I made a mistake, you know, I was very critical of it, uh, never to do it again. Uh, and in that sense, I, I, I could be described as having, having being a little, little intolerant. Or maybe sometimes a little more than just a little. One former pupil described his training with Dr. DeBakey as an absolutely wonderful experience. That was until he went from doing just rounds and moved into the OR. What Dr. Edward B. Dietrich experienced next was a first-hand lesson in what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. On one case, it was a mitral valve patient we were operating on. And he, and I, I thought I was doing a pretty good job. He says, you know, you don't want to help me. He said, Dr. Dietrich, you don't, you don't want to help me. I mean, aren't you interested in this case? He said, I, you just don't want to help me. He said, you go over there and stand in the corner. You go stand in the corner, and maybe you can learn how we do these cases. I mean, it was terrible. It got to be so bad, and then, then, it was so bad in the operating room, but then I had to go out and make rounds with him and do all the patient work and everything. It got so bad that the anesthesiologist and the other surgeons in the lunchroom, when I'd go in there, they'd say, Ted, don't, don't scrub anymore. Don't go in there anymore, because he's going to kill you. It's gonna, he's going to absolutely kill you. One day, while DeBakey was tied up in a complicated valve case, he sent word for Dietrich to prep the next patient and expose for ephemeral popliteal bypass. Urged on by his colleagues watching from the dome above, Dietrich made a fateful decision. I would have never done it if those guys hadn't been up there. I'd have never done it. But they were, you know, they were, they give you the signal, you know, I mean, go. so I, I did the bypass. And in those days, when, it, when we did a, finished a bypass, we would put a little needle in, shoot some dye in, and take a picture on the table to test the distal end of it, the lower end of it. It was a routine that we, we, we did on every case with Dr. Bakey. So I did that. I got the x-ray back in. I put the x-ray on the, the view box. So the x-ray's in the view box, the graph's in, and I'm standing there at attention. 
Dr. Bakey walks in. He says, where are you? And I said, well, Dr. Bakey, I put the graft in, and the x-ray's over here. He walked over, looked at the x-ray, and walked out. I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm fired. Didn't say a word to me. Did not say a word. And I was sure I'd finish rounds, and he was going to call Art Bell and say, get, get this joker out of here. So we're going down, we're going across the, the, uh, the bridge, full speed, and all of a sudden, he stops like this. And it's almost like dominoes. All these guys are, he turns to me, he said, uh, Ted, he says, tomorrow morning, he says, you're going to start operating in room number five. Room number five was the training room for the DeBakey Associates. The next day, I started operating there. It was like night and day. He, he never, ever, ever from that time on treated me any way like, except like an associate. He was testing me. Life is a book that we study. I believe every physician who uh, thinks about the experience he's had over time with his patients has experiences he can't explain. I've had patients that one could describe as miracles because they shouldn't have lived, but they did, you know? And I've had other patients who shouldn't have died, but they did. And I can't explain that death, even after an autopsy was made. The eternal quest for knowledge and understanding, Michael E. DeBakey has dedicated his life to this mission. He has pursued it with great intellect, integrity, and compassion. His research has led to many successes and many honors, but his focus has always been centered on his service to humanity, his role as a doctor sacred, his commitment to his patients unbounded. You know, for the surgeon, the operating room is, is, is almost sacred it's because it, it has more to do with, with uh, the continuous continuation of life than any other part of the hospital. And every time a patient dies, um, you know, I, sort of, I die a little bit. And I, and I think that's what happens to you. Uh, you never quite completely get over the, the death of that patient. I mean, you, you know, it's a failure. You feel like you failed. And, and the, the, the failure is, 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 is uh, very profound because it's, it's a loss of a life. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2006 New Cardiovascular Horizons Achievement Award recipient, Louisiana's own Dr. Michael E. DeBakey.